Hello everyone, it's Jason here, and today I'm excited to share with you a new episode in my series, Exploring Buddhism and Zen. I had the opportunity to meet with Hyangaksani. Hyangaksani is a Zen monk and teacher at the Zen Center in Regensburg. He became a student of Zen Master Sung Song in 1989 and received Inca from Zen Master Sung Song in 2001. Hyang Gaksanim has compiled and edited several of Zen Master Sung Song's books, including The Compass of Zen, The Whole World is a Single Flower, and also Wanting Enlightenment is a Big Mistake. He is also the author of the Korean bestseller, Man Heng, from Harvard to Hwagesa. Hyang Gaksanim and I talked about a lot of things our interview went for almost two hours, so for the YouTube format, I posted here a little over an hour of our meeting. I highly recommend you listen to the full podcast. I will be putting that up on my Patreon page, so if you're on Patreon, you will have access to that. If you're interested in joining my Patreon, I'm putting a link down below to that. Okay, that's enough talking for me. Let's get started with this interview. All right, hello everyone. Welcome to the new episode of Exploring Buddhism and Zen. Today, I'm very happy to have Hyung Gak Sunim here. Thank you, Sunim, for being here today. Really happy to have this experience with you. We have a lot to cover. <laughs> a lot of questions were flooded in. Uh, a question that um, always comes up and I'm sure you've gotten this a lot before, is mm -hmm. how you actually got into Zen practice. What, what are the events that led you into Zen? Um, I, you know, I, I always feel that my earliest memories were what you would call existential. I was always, as a kid, struck with sort of somehow the bizarreness of our existence, um, the fact that things live and die. And I was raised in a very Catholic family with a deep, you know, every Sunday spirituality. So I prayed to understand this. Uh, my cousin died when I was 14. He was the same age, the same name as me. We looked quite similar. We were best friends. Uh, one day we're playing uh, baseball in the backyard. And two days later, a phone call comes that he's been, you know, killed in a car accident and I go to the funeral and 14 years old look, you know, and here's the kid that I'd been fighting over a piece of pizza with a few <laughs> days earlier at our summer house. And now he's in this box with this weird makeup on the suit and he smelled weird. And so something about that typified this sense of a kind of tear in the fabric of, uh, of what this reality seemed to be up until that point so i had this this question and um yeah i mean one thing led to another there are whole chapters of stories there that are not so interesting but going to university i was still gripped with this question very very intensively and um just wanted to understand why was i born why am i born in america with all this wealth and privilege and opportunity and and uh, some kid is born and you know sub-Saharan Africa with no chance at survival, uh, you know, with wild animals, <laughs> mercenary armies you know, threatening them and disease. And w why does one become one thing and one become another? It was something that really gripped me. So I did a lot of social justice stuff in university to, to sort of come up with an answer to that, like the anti-apartheid movement. And, uh, even spent some time in a jail cell with Cornell West twice. <laughs> Once, definitely, uh, that I remember in the second one. I don't know if I'm mixing up. We were in a court together, too, doing the anti-apartheid stuff. That's my most significant name drop for the entire conversation. But it shows the depths. I was like really mad on that you could solve this question of the seeming unreality of life through social justice work. And... Uh, that led to a feeling of some sort of accomplishment. Apartheid was overthrown, but still then it, it just became a, a crime center. You know, all these places, once the dictatorship disappears, another uh, sort of hell appears of some kind. So I saw outside changing outside reality is not it. So what am I? What's the thing that wants to change this? 
And yeah, just went to um, graduate school, but I was really struck with um, some of the things I had read in uh, Zen Mind, Beginner's Mind when I got out of university. Um, and just the fact of a radical direct arrival at it mm -hmm. through meditation seems to be a really compelling thing to, to, to look into. So I started to do a little bit, but I, I didn't have a formal teacher or anything. Um, and just before entering, um, going to Cambridge, Massachusetts and entering graduate school, I went back to my alma mater campus to knock on the door of this building that was next to the apartment that I lived in with my girlfriend <laughs> during university. And two doors away was this place called New Haven Zen Center. <laughs> And I remember I used to like, you know, be coming home from parties at university on the weekends and coming home at like 4 a.m. with my buddies and, you know, after a few beers or whatever and look up and see these people getting up at 5 and see the light go on at 5 a.m. and shaved heads sometimes coming in and out the front door. I mean, it's probably Musan Sanim and Dave uh -huh. Sanim and <laughs> probably that whole generation of people coming for retreats and who knows, maybe... I don't know if I met or, or was there at a time that Desan's name was there, but I was there for two years. So somehow I was like brushing up against the air of that. And when I, after school, before grad school, when I was looking for a group to practice with, I remembered that place and I went back and knocked on the door and just like boom, went in and connected really deeply with it. And, and I told them, oh, I'm going to school in Cambridge in a few months. And they were like, do we have some good news for you? We have a center, a Zen center in Cambridge. Mm -hmm. You can continue your practice there. And I really like the energy of the people and uh, just, yeah, everything just felt right about it from the very first time. Very little of it felt strange or foreign. Some of the forms kind of are unusual the first time to do it, but mm -hmm. the energy and the consciousness and the goodness of these people made me go, okay, um, let's, let's take a look deeper with them. So I went to Cambridge and moved into the Cambridge Zen Center pretty quickly. And um, that was it. Just boom. That was, I'm so lucky. That's how I found uh, the Dharma. Mm -hmm. And what about uh, Zen Master Sung Song? I know you met him. Was it in the Cambridge area or did you meet yeah, him? Yeah, it was during the time that I was in the Cambridge Zen Center. So I moved in basically in October of 89, mm. which I had just started graduate school in September of 89. I got everything set up and I first thing went down and found this place and knocked on the door and did a practice and it was you know just like new haven and, uh, it felt really good and the people were just as nice as the people in new haven and there was this really good vibe and i kind of could pick up pretty quickly that it was a significant person and uh but that much i had no idea who or what he was so i i wasn't pulled initially to the teaching or his book or his name of course we didn't have the internet back then so you didn't have like videos out there so but what was being enacted you know just by the people's energy and and the, the practice it was it's just transparent and clear and, um so then when they you know as you ask questions and you learn a little bit more about him of course he seemed like this almost godlike figure to have met the teachings of seemed to be um, quite unbelievable. And then, and within a few months, literally within three months, I was deciding to take the next year off grad school and go to Korea and sit like a monk, sit in a retreat for 90 days. And so I only physically got to meet him, I think, yeah, I only physically got to meet him in January of 1990. Um, I visited. Providence Zen Center, and he gave a talk, and um, I had this was really pumped up for the talk, and really excited. Wow, oh, there's going to be this Zen master energy, <laughs> and it came in, and actually, it was somewhat of a kind of a disappointment, mm -hmm. but for reasons that will become apparent later, it, he just didn't have the energy, and it was low kind of contact with what people were saying, and I walked out, and I had this like, ah, oh. well, I didn't realize it then, but then a week or so past and people who were commenting on it were saying, oh, he's having some, he's having some health challenges that he might not be coming back to the States anymore. And uh, people are encouraging him to stay in Asia. So when I heard that, I put it together. I said, okay, 
if I want to practice with this person, um, it looks like I have to get my butt to Asia as soon as possible. So when I heard of the opportunity of the 90 day retreat that lay people could participate in with monks and nuns, I just grabbed it, took a year off graduate school and saved up as much as I could and went and showed up there in November, 1990. And that was uh, Shinmansa, did you sit at? Was that yeah, the, first Hua yeah. Sa, in, yeah, uh -huh. okay. got up there and got yeah, you know, the base of Hua Sa, and then, yeah, and then we had the three days later, I'm at some like totally poor temple in the mountains of uh, Kedion Mountains. Shinmansa, uh, Kedion San Shinmansa. Yeah, and yeah, and that was it. And wow, what a mind F that was in just the most unbelievable ways. I was blown away. Yeah. I also sat there. That was my very first retreat and it just completely mm. blew me away. It changed my life actually about this. Uh, yeah, were everything. you a monk already then or was No, it no, I was a lay people? person, but as you know, as you know, everyone had to shave their heads, 20 yes. people yeah, for yeah. the whole 90 days. So Right, right, right. So for you as uh, perhaps for you as for me, I I got the ex the final explosion to that I just have to to become a monk in that situation. I don't know if that was instrumental for you or not. It, it was actually. So that's what I was going to ask you. That probably led you into the, the monastic life. Did you become a monk soon after or? Yeah, um, it was. Um, that retreat ended in um, February of 91. And um, I had another year of graduate school to do. And I actually, a part of me was just going to like, I, just, I realized I don't need a degree. I don't want a degree and the expense and all of the, you know, sort of anxiety of getting what this piece of paper that I realized, not like realized in the retreat, but was becoming more and more confirmed and reconfirmed and reconfirmed that, you know, as De Sansanim said, if you have a hundred PhDs at the hour of your death, how will they ever help you? And that was pretty clear by like day five of the retreat. And um, so it was just a question of all the cultural, you know, integration of that and obviously family stuff that had to be done. So it took some time. I had to go back to the States and just finish this. And I'm really glad I did. People, there were some who just said, cut it off and go to the mountains. And there were some who advised to just finish it, to have it done. And I'm really glad that I don't have to look over my shoulder at that. So that I completed that. And, and in the meantime, I did a, I did a retreat uh, in 92, that a uh, solo retreat in Western Massachusetts that utterly uh, sort of mega confirmed. <laughs> um, and um, yeah, it was just, how do I do this? How do I be it? You know, how do I, how do I enter this path, you know, and, and do it well? I heard a story. I don't know if this is you or not. Someone, one of our monks sat a solo retreat, and I believe it was one of these no sleep retreats. Have you heard about this? <laughs> yeah, I've done it. <laughs> Were yeah. you, yeah, tell, tell me about that. I'm curious. I heard about what that means. Well, what, is, what does that entail? Those no sleep retreats, like 3,000 vow retreats, or like kind of maybe bad, this is it's not the best way of explaining it, but there's a part of it. So don't attach it too much or a solo retreat, hundred day solo retreat or a coche, those sorts of experiences of doing like a no sleep retreat. It's like extreme sports. In other words, it's not indicative of a true and real practice. It's a kind of out through the boxes and borders and um, getting like this cosmic view of mind it's not something you would do every day it's um it's not special uh, people can have it in different sorts of altered states nowadays perhaps with psychedelics some aspect of that um de Sansanim always talked about you know on his zen circles zero degrees 90 degrees 180 degrees 270 degrees 360 which is zero. So this 270 is really important. And actually a lot of people have come to the Dharma through that 270 experience, which is if you, you know, 
certainly the first generation of people after the 60s counterculture and the psychedelics revolution, a lot of people came out of these 270 experiences, but they were chemically induced, and, but had a sense that there is another reality that might be manipulated or participated in either well or, or, or suboptimally. And so Desantzin talks about in consciousness, there is this realm of kind of a magic energy and that that some, some sort of attainment of that is helpful for a really full insight into consciousness, you know, to just to go from karmic eye and then nothingness and then nothingness and then truth. But in between, there's this realm of magic, the cartoon space of right. imagination. So, so something like that is um, not great for the body. <laughs> it really wrecked the body for a couple of months, but um it was powerful. I didn't want to go to sleep at the, when the seven days was over, two other guys and I asked the master at the temple if we could continue it. Cause it's like when you do a fast, if you've ever done like a one week, if you've ever done a water fast, for like a week or 10 days or 12 days, you get to the point where you even look at food and you find it dis not disgusting, but you, cause you, you're not producing gas and poop. Right, and, and you have a lot of energy. You have a lot of energy and you're, exactly, Jason, and you're clear. You have this like other, almost ether-like clarity. So the power of something like, um, you know, a strong keto or a one week not lying down to sleep is you get that of a fast. And then part of you goes, wow, do I really want to eat? Now that I know how pure it can be, and that's something also good to experience that attachment to that that's pure right. state. Yeah. So um, doing those things is really important for that reason to see conscious. It's like the way these people, this guy we do, he went up into a Red Bull balloon up into the edge of outer space and they were filming him live. And then he like stood at the doorway and he looked at the circumference of the earth and then he went down or the way these, the reason these people like go to outer space and, and, you know, come in these orbitals, William Shatner and Jeff Bezos. It's this ability, this chance to see the edge of things and then take a little peek over that and then come back to earth and have something to offer people. And now in the case of those people, they're paying for something that they're not doing on their own effort. But when you do a no sleep or a strong keto or a 3000 bowels or say something you could used to recommend, you know, one of our people became a, a nun. She did 3,000 bows for 100 days at Providence Zen Center, Myojisanin. Mm -hmm. And she just, she got that super clarity about, should I become a nun? Should I not? And she just got to the edge of space and she could kind of see a lot more of the Milky Way. And it came back to her life as a mother and everything and went, I know what I got to do. So it's a good thing to take a view and to enter that kind of power of the 270 power. Uh, but not to stay there. And obviously you can't because you'll go crazy with that. Yeah. I mean, many, many people do attach to that experience. For sure. Yeah. yeah. I was uh, remembering in Providence Zen Center, we used to rent space to the shamans. They're called the Four Wind Society. Mm -hmm. Very interesting group. But mm -hmm. I, I picked up the teacher from the airport and they're, and they're talking about their solo retreat experience. Something very similar, kind of in the 270 realm. If people don't know what we're talking about, you can look mm -hmm. up Zen Master Sung Song's Zen Circle. And this mm -hmm. is talking, uh, pointing to different consciousness points, I guess. But anyways, uh, he, <laughs> he was telling me that they go on these wild trips, you know. Mm -hmm. And I said, how do you, how do you break that experience, you know, because how do you not hold it and, and when you leave? This is an interesting technique. I've never heard this one before, but he says, well, well, well what we do is uh, on the last day, we just drink a bunch of alcohol until you're just puking up <laughs> yeah. and then you feel so shitty, right? All that experience just goes away. And yeah. I was like, huh? I mean, th there's other ways to do it, I'm sure. But how did yeah, you yeah. find yourself? You said you said you wanted to continue. Yeah, well, a lot of a lot of in, in some Korean temples and Japanese temples, they have that same thing. You know, they have this thing at the end of a Japanese, some strong Japanese retreat to a couple of bottles of sake. So that uh, the shaman master who picked you up is, yeah, they do a very interesting um, exploration of that space. You you correctly see it. The, the, the four winds work, the shamanistic work, which is becoming more popular, enters and really um, utilizes that 270 possibility. And then, and they also have a comeback to come back to this 
just now mind point to it. But yeah, that's very powerful. Um, yeah, after the uh, after that, it was in the middle of a 90 day kill chase. So you're 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 really acclimated and um, your body is physically attuned. They just take you just lock. All that happens is you have the same experience. It's the same 90 day retreat, same position. But um, you just lock up your blanket and pillow and bed mat in a closet and mm. it's just locked up for a week and you don't have access to it. So but basically you're just sitting 24 hours a day. So your body is basically acclimated to the environment. And then you just get this incredible. You just, you just, you just it's like that guy who went up in the Red Bull thing. I remember when they, he was at the doorway, just like, I was like all this effort and technology and stuff. And he's got the view he's looking for. And you just get something. You get some perspective. Mm -hmm. And you come back and then you have some aspect of meditation that you can maybe help people with or, or right. steer them through because a lot of people enter that. Some people who enter who have a very bad death experience or we're going to have a lot of these folks coming from the wars now with, with trauma. Um, they've there's so much changed in the neuropharmacology that that 270 space is can come to dominate, you know, some aspect of their being. So for us, we just, you know, the Korean temple has this built in three days where, you know, you go to the hot bath and they give you nice food and, you know, um, you sleep, but we kind of didn't want to. You're, it's like a fast. You, yeah. Yeah. You, that first bit of food, the first time you like have gas after that, you're like, how is it really worth it to put this <laughs> impurity back in my system? But then you see that, you see that attachment too. Right. And if you're keeping your eyes open, that's why it's great to do it in the middle of a, a, an intensive retreat. Cause then you're back on the cushion Monday morning, more or less. And what has presented itself, that pure state seeing like, Oh shit. Oh, this, this regular kind of retreat, which was intense a week before, ah, this is not, this is not enough. Then you see that attachment for wanting more, wanting more, wanting more. Want, and that's a great thing to attain, you know, as part of senior practice. So I found it to be really helpful, but eh, not a lifestyle. I mean, one time <laughs> well, I mean, just like fasting, you can't do it forever, I guess, too. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, yeah, with me, I, I, I do long fast, but it just makes my relationship to food more clear, I think, too. Yes, I mean, yes, also yes. heals the body, but then, it, you know, uh, makes a relationship more clear. So, yeah, that's, were, yeah, that's the reason why we do it. When you mm -hmm. were uh, so a monk in Korea, how long did you spend as a monastic in Korea? I first went, I mean, the first trip, the first retreat was November 1990, and I really started living there in 92. 92 was the second Shin once I killed Jay. Point. 92, 93. And um, I came back and ordained and then basically from 94 sh straight through, um, Desan Sanseem died in 2003. So that would be nine or 10 years there. And, um, and then I spent another three years there to sort of, um, there's a tradition in the East of offering the we pay, the, the sort of the memorial tablet of the teacher, not making any radical changes for three years. So I followed that as much as I could until 2007. When did you, you got Inca Huagesa, right? Uh, what year? Yeah. Was, what, what 2001. Year? Two so weeks 2001. before nine. Yeah, two, two weeks. One week before 911. Oh, good timing. I know you, you taught in the quantum school of Zen. Mm hmm. Actually, yeah. last week, maybe we could talk about that. Last week, you said yeah. you still teach in the quantum schools. I'm and, still well, teaching in the well, quantum schools. So school let's, get, let's, let's <laughs> rewind. So well, there's a cosmic, you know, there's a, it's, it's not like trick speech. There's a, there's a cosmic sense of that. Yeah. Desan Sanim is still teaching. So just to clear that part of the runway, Desan Sanim is still teaching in the quantum school of Zen. You know, Jesus is still teaching us, really. That is still as present now or even more present than when he was with us physically so in that sense i'm still part of that work of what is the quantum school of zen the quantum school of zen is the collection or practices of dharma as articulated by zen master sung san to lead 
practitioners to a direct and radical insight into the nature of mind, which he often called don't know, through the practices of bowing, chanting, sitting, mantra, and koan, kongan. That's quantum school of Zen. That's quantum school of Zen. Quantum school of Zen is the practice of teachings which lead the student to a direct and radical, meaning unfiltered, insight into the nature of their nature and all beings' nature being the same nature. Techniques, technologies, through the softwares that he promoted strongly, effectively, and very efficaciously of bowing, chanting, sitting, and koan practice, kongan, which means the great Tao. And I think I left out, and then of course, sub ones of silent meal and, and you know, right. temple life. And all that. Not a lot of people live in the temple, so you can't say that's one of the central ones, but it's part of it. So that is quantum school of Zen. Quantum school of Zen is that. that. It's not a brand, it's not a house, it's not a building, it's not a computer program somewhere. When the sands, when these buildings all blow down and everything, they'll say, you know, when they say, what is Zen Master Sung San? What is his quantum school? They'll say, well, it is the this of the this of the this of the this of this, you know, whose, you know, Sangha leadership and structure is based out of, you know, this or that office in this region or whatever. But that's the secondary, the primary, the primary point of what is quantum is that awareness it's the awareness it's not the methods of the awareness it's the awareness so i yeah i guess i was asking about the secondary the primary sounds pretty clear mm. but you you know eventually you when did you move to germany yeah so the course of events in korea is that i went to korea and saw that desan sim's teaching wasn't known there as much as i expected and felt it must be known I think a lot of us, when we get to Korea, realize how Christian it is and, and resistant. And then even within Buddhism, how much, and he, you know, he was before the internet. So he was teaching abroad and Koreans just forgot, you know, about him. And it's only after he died that they started to go, oh, there was this something um, by his own, you know, coming to be more well known through what he worked hard to do, which is produce all these Western students. But I felt with um, the media coming to me and asking my opinion and being able to speak Korean and I had great love for the country and wrote a bestseller about that love for the tradition and gratitude, that thing exploded. I became well known, which is not a great thing if you're a spiritual person. Yeah, yeah, let's let's talk about that book real quick before you continue on. Yeah. Uh, if, if people don't know, I I, I don't real know, quick. I, I think in English is from Har Harvard to Hwagesa. It's a it's a yeah. book that Hyung Aksunim wrote. It became very popular. So yeah, I, it's just uh, a story of how I found the Dharma and became a monk. Korea in its industrialization and modernization in the 60s and 70s and 80s, they aped very closely kind of American Christian styles and culture and social norms and, and um, uh, values. And of course, the American missionaries were pumping all sorts of stuff into the country, hospitals and schools and everything. So they developed this very much. If you want to be modern, you have to be American style Christian attitude. And Buddhism was being and has been and still is being pushed to the side, but very strongly in the 70s and 80s. And um, so there was a great ignorance of their own tradition. It was mostly seen as something that grandparents did or people who wanted to have a exactly. baby or something. So De Sansanim was this, you know, like it said, uh, uh, wind in the mirror of Zen, like wind rising on a, uh, like waves arising on a windless sea. He was in Korean Buddhism, this spontaneous, like, wake up. So he gave it all to us in the West. He spent all that time not having his own network of, of students and powerful speakers for him and helpers in Korea. He gave it all to everyone outside Korea so much. So um, it was not as well known there as it should have been. And I felt very bad about that. We all felt bad about that. We always do. Um, I wish we were better well known in Germany and every other place. But um, so I just had been translating the Compass of Zen into Korean, 
because it didn't appear in Korean. And I felt that before he dies, there should be one absolutely clear record of what he stood, what he pointed out in every area of Buddhism. And he even knew that the compass of Zen was that representation of, if you could put it into words, whatever was his view of Dharma on this and this subject, 12 chain links and chain of original origination, four noble truths, this and that, this was his view. But what was the genius of his compass of Zen teachings and the lectures he gave was, he, he, he was pointing out the Zen in Hinayana, the Zen of Mahayana, and the Zen of Zen. There's a lot of Zen, kind of this is Zen, but then there's the Zen of Zen, you know, the beer of beers. <laughs> that was Budweiser <laughs> right, right, in right, right, right. my dad's yeah, the beer of beers. So the Compass of Zen was coming out, and um, people weren't taking it because it was such a thick book, and it was the IMF in Korea. So some publisher asked if I would write a book about why I found the Dharma and they would then agree they would promise to publish the compass of Zen translation in Korean and there's a whole back story behind that that I don't really talk much and that's not really necessary for right here but they you know put me in a position of if I wanted to see the compass of Zen published I'd have to find something that they could make money on. And they thought they could make money on this dumb white guy's story about he, he came, it was a Christian company, and it was a Christian company too, hardcore Christian. But very interesting, but they saw, the people saw a buck. They saw a buck and I didn't have the sophistication to get out of the way of that. This book was in Korean, right? Yeah, it was in Korean, yeah. Wrote right. it in five ne weeks. Never tra uh, translated the English at all? No, no, I strangled that <laughs> in, in its crib it shall never see the light of day in english oh i'm sure someone's gonna do it maybe oh, when you're I'm dead sure i will find that person and it will not be a good it'll probably happen when you die i guarantee you it's gonna be in no, no 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 i gotta I, I gotta fuck shit up more but um no someone uh, two two people offered to, i got two offers to translate it and uh i said no and uh, one in japanese which would have been interesting but and um, the other one was the the publisher. When it ran out, the five year original contract, I the publisher offered a mega bonus to resign it, and I just said no. He said like mega, no nine tanka. So that came out, and I became well known. That came out, and then all the bullshit really hit the fan. <laughs> Seriously. No, I mean we could get into that. So I made sure that they signed a contract with Shambhala. I saw their printed signature on this contract with Shambhala agreeing to uh, publish the Compass of Zen in Korean, Korean translation, which I had done with someone, worked very hard on to get as clear in Korean as it was in English, just as a record, then leave it alone. Then I did, I did my shit, you know, inside, but I still have it. The debt to him, the, the debt to him is impossible. I know you said, yeah, becoming well known uh, mm -hmm. is, is not favorable sometimes. But I remember living in the Providence Zen Center. Mm -hmm. And I remember Korean, young Korean Americans coming to the Zen Center mm -hmm. because maybe they read your book and got inspired to practice, mm -hmm. which is amazing, right? Mm hmm and then you have the other side where it's like a love hate thing with you. I hear like I, I got I yeah. got yeah. I got messages from all kinds of people, emails, whatever. When I you know we talk we've been talking about this by the way for what six months. I don't know, doing this, <laughs> mm, yeah. Yeah. and some people were very excited, like oh wow, can you ask him this? I can't wait to see him and. He's a great teacher, and some people like, oh, be careful, you know, be careful. Yeah, be careful. Like, <laughs> like I have a question. Someone's asking, why be such a showman or a self-promoter, self-exposer? Um, I don't know how many times you saw Desan Sanim in person. Few, but four or five. Yeah, Desan Sanim was. If you look at the videos, he was a constant <laughs> showman. Yeah, that's for sure. His charisma. He would act out the role. Why don't you know? No, 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 no. I only talk to you. Why only put it down? Okay. Then his face oh, cannot, he cannot sink anything. You know, he was completely acting out his teachings because he was passionate about them. He wanted to give anything he could to 
your experience in the room that you would let go of your thinking. So yeah, it's, I've just have this way of expressing things I, I am cursed with because I actually am a quite very solitary, even somewhat antisocial person hmm. in, in some strong ways. And I feel best when I'm alone. Um, I feel creative and, 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 um, of course I get that in my meditation, but when you agree to run a residential center or to go out and organize and go and lead retreats and everything's got to be done and the cooking and the food and the person's a vegan and they worry about that and they, they want to sit next to that and they have an allergy and connect, you're, you know, you're using a lot of, you know, mental energy. So, uh, I like to get the point across pretty straight and, um, by whatever means necessary. Uh, and I think, um, you know, when I first went to Korea, Korean monks used to criticize. They'd say, yo, not correct monk. Why? You know, reason number 632. <laughs> that day. <laughs> Which is a good thing. That's why we go there to get to kick our butts. But some of it's a little pointless. So they, they, some of them said, when you give Dharma talk, you talking like this. You say, you talking like you using your hands. I was like, yeah. I, I mean, not so. I was a very young monk. I was like, yes. What's the problem inside? And they're like, well, that's a TV show, not <laughs> Dharma. They have their, they said to give a correct Dharma talk, your hands must down here and only looking down. They say, not, not so much smile, not so much smile. You too much smile. But they sound to you look, I'm not copying him, but what made him, why if you go to Korea, there was a whole generation of Korean Zen monks who completely looked down their nose at him at so much of what his teaching was. Some of them who were very close friend practitioners of me, of my own. A whole group of them who said, you know, he wasn't a, he was a, uh, just a pogyosa. He's just a Dharma propagator because he wasn't only staying in the mountains. You know, he gave up his beautiful solitude to give the stuff to us and to deal with this country food and this problem and this culture and this, you know, situation teaching the white folks how to be good meditators. Um, so he himself was looked at as a, he was very media savvy at the very beginning of his life. He was criticized by Korean Buddhism for, he started, in Korean Buddhism, there's one, newspaper that every single temple must accept it's like the catholic official catholic newspaper that every church gets like from rome well it's just like the news of the order and big announcements and awards and new decisions of the order and ads and stories about buddhism that was started when that first started in like 1958 many korean monks protested because they said this is american style communication Temples didn't even have telephones. Many, most didn't have electricity until the mid-70s. So for the order to put out news and updates of programs and things in a newspaper form was considered to be a betrayal of true dharma because you're, you're borrowing. We, don't, we just think newspaper is just something that's in your drawer, but that was like the iPhone of the day for news. You know? So bringing that in and putting Buddhist stuff with photographs was considered almost sacrilegious. And the monk who set that up was severely criticized for adopting American style like the Christians. The monk who established that newspaper, which is still in use today by every temple in Korea, was Zen Master Sun San. And he was excruciated. How are you a Zen monk and you are setting up some media Thing we're the no words only direct arrive. There are people who took the idea a little too far. So Desant's name was very early on an adopter of it um, and used it really skillfully. I think very well. In fact, I think there are ways that the sangha can help that get out more. But he left behind a very rich record of things um, where he taught in the media and in the Korean newspapers and gave interviews and and on TV. There. Are, if you go onto the Korean internet or you want to type some of the words in, there's lots of documentaries where he has given interviews and he's his entertaining, engaging, a little bit kind of gussed up the way the conservative Korean would see it. But 
yeah, I'm just, I'm just flowing with this. I don't have any plan. I just watched too much American TV growing up. And seriously, I mean, I try not to go too far with expression, but it just comes out of me and, and I still feel this enthusiasm. And I, I just want other people to be as enthusiastic in their own heart for the goodness it does to them as I feel apparently for myself. You know, so it can be an excess. Yeah. I, you know, it's, it's, pretty clear too i mean people connect with different things so that's why there's many different teachers i mean i'm just thinking of the quantum schools and it's amazing how many different styles of teaching there are even though the point of it is fantastic yeah it's it's amazing no it's it's it's, that's what they sounds wanted that's what they sounds wanted i remember working on the conan book with him literally i can remember him saying this in his room in cambridge zen center at 199 auburn street in the future, ah, oh, many Zen master quantum schools and day anytime new commentary, any and then he said their style appear. He said then any many then he said many styles appear. He said in China many schools appear. Nine mountain school means nine mountain, but bone is the same. He only care about the bone. Right. He didn't give a shit about anything else. He said bone is the same. But he said, in the future, many styles appear, many commentaries. So he's telling us kind of like, don't get fixed on a correct, I, my, my takeaway, I could be wrong, but don't get fixed on a, what these words are. In the future will be what is spoken about these konans. He, he was trying many ways to also connect too, using different things. And like you said, got criticized for it. I remember even when we started the online song a long time ago, I started live streaming in 2008, I believe, or 2009. And people thought it was weird. And when we started the online song, us, some people thought there's no way that can work. There's no way. And yeah. it's like, yeah, maybe. I don't know. Yeah. I just know this person here has yeah. no support for practice. So <laughs> how do we connect? Yeah, so, long come and COVID knocked on the door. And now, oh, you know, online. Oh, right. is, oh no. no question it was it. amazing. Yeah. Like sure, even, sure. Uh, yeah, when we started the online song before the pandemic, we were encouraging other Zen centers to stream. But they, oh, no, you know, we don't have the technology or... All, all kinds of excuses. The pandemic sure, sure, hit, sure. then everybody's online. <laughs> now it's just essential that, you know, we have to have something, some voice online. And, and De Sansanim, I'll find for this purpose, he gave an interview. And I got to find it. I just have to do some Googling in Korean, where in the interview, he admits that he knows that he has been criticized for betraying Choge Buddhism. Mm -hmm. He admits to the reporter, he says, and I think it was taken out as a kind of super quote in the middle of the article. He says, I remember he repeated it. I might have been in the room that time. I mean, I wasn't much, but at that time, that was this whole thing happening near the end of his life. But he acknowledges that he knows, not in any weird way, he knows in a heavy way, but he's heard that he is considered to be someone who betrayed Korean Buddhism. Why? Well, they're, you know, lay teachers being equal to monks and nuns, women being able to be teachers, monks bowing to lay people. So much nuns being able to live in a temple with monks. So much of his of his actualization of the Dharma for us in our Western context, he was called for back in his home country as a betrayer. So that makes me curious about yeah, trying new things connected mm. to today's world. Um, someone was asking about what, what was the inspiration of this formless track, this music album? I've heard a little bit of it. Uh, tell me about that. How did this all start? Actually, to be quite honest, the story starts 25 years ago, and I'll try not to bore your people here, but there is some Dharma in it. There is something really interesting, which is that when we, when I first became a monk, the first whole world, it was the year before a whole world's a single flower conference. So it was in 1992 uh, in China, we went through Hong Kong. And um, they saw the of course, great Daebong, Dolmun's name and Musang's name were all on the trip and helping and helping us, you know, to be able to have a chance to practice near Daesan's name. 
and we, they always take us out to vegetarian restaurants. And I saw in these vegetarian restaurants, of course, there's all this Buddhist iconography, which when you've just come from the West is fascinating to see a lot. Now it's commonplace in Europe all over, but it wasn't so much then. And so some of your Buddhist faith was a little bit confirmed. But they always had Buddhist chanting on. And it was so, you know, it was just kind of the schmaltzy. <laughs> but it was cool. And I liked that. I remember I got like a CD or two to like, I just, I just, the, the, and the marriage of, of modern music and, and that as a way of spreading Dharma. I was already in this exuberant phase of, of how do we let people know about this? And so anyway, so I just went back to Korea and, you know, did training there. And, but I always remembered that. And you'd go out to restaurants and there was no Buddhist presence. There was no representation of the Dharma in Korean popular culture. And I saw this like, you know, Christian stuff and Christmas, well, the Christmas songs and love songs and they praised Jesus at the end. It was okay, great, whatever turned you on. But the Buddhist tradition, which, you know, I'd seen both halves of, of the possibility there and okay, yeah, teach their own. But one really is an optimized thing for really helping world peace and, and this modern scientific. So I just saw that this wasn't in popular culture. So one day I got involved in this group who's, the head of the group, there was a social group of Korean kind of business people and people in the arts and media who met once a month and they would meet in a nice restaurant and they wanted to have someone be their kind of like guide or spiritual teacher, mm. which was mostly a social thing for them. Anyway, I get invited and a person sitting next to me, they always put me next to was the mother of this singer whose name is Sai, Sai, the singer Sai, Kangnam style. But this is 20 years before Kangnam style. He was a famous in Korea, but he wasn't this global famous person, which is why I would think to have this idea. One day I brought a CD of chanting and I gave it to the guy's mother. I said, you know, your son's famous and all that. He knows music people. If he would be interested in showing me, it wasn't my teaching, wasn't my voice. I wanted some old Korean monk, but my goal was to get Desan Sanin's teaching out into the world by any means necessary. I'd never planned, but I had this dim sense of paying it back, paying it back. Seriously, you know, the other monks in Quagas, I used to say I was the Jesuit. I was like this missionary because I'm Catholic background. You, you, oh, the Jesuit. Oh, what time do you, oh, the Jesuits coming in five minutes. But I had that about the Sanctum teaching. I still do. So I gave her the CD, this crazy idea. Can your son hmm, put it together with some techno or introduce me to someone, you know, who could do that? And so I never heard anything back. I wouldn't expect to. He, of course, he later became very famous with, I mean, he was famous, but he became globally famous with the song. I just forgot about it. Whatever. I don't care. I had other projects and books to do for his real books. Then about a year into the pandemic, a gentleman from the UK named an artist by the name of Armin Ray contacted and said, I'm a Buddhist for 20 years in Throssel Hole. Um, and my teacher died some years ago and I've been looking at Dharma teachings on the internet and I connect with these teachings that have your name on it. And um, do you mind if I put really the Dharma talk voice to some music? Can I send you a song just for, because he's retired, not for money, because I'm not thinking about money. I inherited money from my mother and I'm okay. And I just want to do this. So I, um, I just said, yeah. So he just did a song and I thought it was really cool. But what I really liked was the Dharma was not just hodgepodge used as some catchy kind of stylish thing. He actually caught the structure of the Dharma talk and all the seed words that needed to convey the point. I'm still blown away. This guy just caught it. So I'm, I'm just really grateful. So he said, oh, you know, I got some time, pandemic, got some time on my hands. Can I do 12 more? And so I started to get a little bit more involved and, um, then with some remixes and some extended ones to get into the space of the song, it's turned into a couple of remixes. It's not to make money. It's all for free on somewhere. And one place where he said, you have to have it for a download and iTunes. I have like made paperwork so that it only goes to Zen Center Regensburg. I'm not here to make money off the Dharma as with all of the books that I was involved with. It would be a sin beyond sins. So, um, it's just out there and it's just a way of me not chopping down trees. 
thing. Right. The thing is, <laughs> they, everyone says that, you know, if you're to be a real teacher, you need to have, you just hear this stuff. People say all sorts of interesting stuff. And you learn some stuff. And people have said a bunch of times, well, to be a real Dharma teacher or whatever, you, there has to be a book of your teaching there. Uh, that's, I guess, an old classical idea. And um, yeah, I mean, you have to. And um, they, even De Sansanin, even De Sansanin himself is beautiful. I never made this connection so deeply before, but for Kobong Sanin, Kobong Sanin didn't say anything. He didn't like giving any kind of Dharma talk unless he was had a couple of bottles of rice wine inside him. He just didn't like to talk. He was an old kind of aristocrat, kind of, you know, imagine some British aristocrat, stiff upper lip, doesn't have much to say. But a couple of glasses of brandy and the stories of the war come out. <laughs> and <Right>. um, <laughs> this really was the war, the Korean War. So he, I was wondering at the end of his life, De Sansanim, not the end of his life, in about 1989 for one of the World Whole World is a Single Flower Conferences, De Sansanim had put together a collection of Kobongson's teachings which is a book you've never seen because it was just printed. He just did it to make sure there's like this filial piety they have, this filial piety that you, filial piety that you, you help with a record of your teacher's books. Now we got films and videos and all that shit. So even if you don't want it, you're going to get filmed and recorded and some record of your teaching is for the next generation. But his generation up until ours was some record. So I don't know. I don't know why I went that way, but people say that I should write a book and I don't want to write a book. I'm tired of writing books. I've written too many already. And it was a great joy and an honor of the honor of this existence. But people aren't reading books. Let's not waste our time. Let's cut to the chase. People are getting their information from videos and images and things. Uh, people are saying that I should do stuff on TikTok and stuff. I don't want to go so cheap or Snapchat. <laughs> really, like good people. No, I, know, I, mean, I, know, I, know, I know. And it's just like, look, then the Dharma is cheap. You know, one thing that the Buddha said, why we take these 400 precepts to become monks, or 250, I should say, 250-ish, is like, you think like, okay, get the basic ones out of the way. What, what is the role, the, the library of stuff to understand? You don't really have to understand them, but boom. One of them is situations where you shouldn't teach the Dharma. Like one situation where you're not supposed to teach the Dharma, one of our precepts as bhikkhus, final bhikkhu precepts, it's interesting. This isn't a rule from, you know, some pope or something. This is the Buddha dealing with a situation. One, it just blows my mind. I'm sorry to be, seem pedantic right now, but I, I'm sharing the joy of what I just recently discovered in Korea well, 20 years ago, but later than when I took the precept. One of the precepts is you're not supposed to teach the Dharma to someone who is sitting in a higher position than you. You shouldn't teach the Dharma to someone who's sitting on a higher stand than you while you're teaching. I was like, when I first heard it, I was like, this is a little, maybe some of this old Vedic kind of form stuff. But it's true, the Buddha had a situation. You know, when you're sitting up above someone, if someone's teaching the Dharma, which is the best news about what to do about mind, about reality, if someone's teaching that and you're looking down, just look at what, you're, what happens when your face, what happens to your face muscles if you look down, imagine your friend is lying down there. Or imagine someone's, when someone is teaching like that in the lecture, when your head's a little bit, a different attitude starts to happen. It's very small, very subtle. So the Buddha said, don't teach Dharma to anyone seated above you. Very interesting. Very interesting. So, um, you know, these, I, I think that he would have disapproved of some cheap forms of, I'm not saying people who do that is cheap. I'm sure there's lots of good monks and nuns, and maybe they will reach people. Certainly the young generation will. That's just not where I'm at. It's a little bit too, like, going with the attention breaking algorithm and our whole job yours and mine as meditation teachers is to hack the fully instantiated algorithm hacked neuronal synaptic systems that people bring to the meditation cushion it's almost not a question anymore now of life and death where did i come from when i was born kind of but now people are so synaptically hacked 
I don't want to be using um, some cheap forms that hyper hack that. Especially when data yeah. could be going to China or something. You know? Well, I mean, I'm mean, imagining in the future, though, people are going to be using TikTok and all that to express this. I know. And that's so that's for another group right. of people that's to what have I mean. yeah. hopefully you the and wisdom I, yeah. and the intuition. I don't have that. Younger people, this isn't like some like grandfather talk like younger people these days, but it's true. Younger people, they're not getting Dharma from a book. You know, the first, I, anytime I'm asked, you know, it came up a little while ago in the talk, you, someone, you and I, I can bet you, Jason, I, you and I have never talked about this subject, but I can bet you $1,000 that you first got some taste of Dharma from a book. Oh, yeah. Okay. The younger generation, they just don't have that, 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 that affinity. Okay, not good, not bad, whatever. Their faces are here, motherfucker. And so if you're going there, if you have a way to do it, to find people and reach them there, by all means do it. So this music is like, you know, I was reading like Schopenhauer and Kant and Hegel. I was lucky. It's not because I was smart. I was lucky. So I worked out like the whole intellectual impasse through books and then found the first book out of university, Zen Mind, Beginner's Mind. And the intimacy and the slowness of reading was possible. It's like to, to move, to, to learn how to get onto a galloping horse, to be on another car that's moving alongside it somehow and then jump onto the horse. To move on from books to Zen was a kind of natural thing. Now there's synapses and they're Dopaminergic systems are on hyperdrive. What would be your advice for younger people, like in this younger generation? And you're right. Uh, a lot of people found me through YouTube. Then yeah, maybe sure, they picked sure. up a book. So sure, yeah, sure. What, what would your advice be to them? Practice. I mean, really? Really? Practice. I mean, I know it sounds like so obvious. But there's so much stuff out there and there's so much gimmick and there's so much sort of shop talk that you kind of have to do in different magisteria of expression. So much, you know, talk that you have to do and kind of um, virtue signaling or whatever in the way Dharma is transmitted. And the algorithm is rewarding and demeriting based on likes and dislikes. So there's going to be a drift towards some sort of Whatever. And Zen has always been, ah, it's been open to, because ah, reality is not buttoned down, you know, ironed up, fit, tight, matched to the T. Reality's got bumps and waves and valleys and troughs and challenges and traumas. And so there's so much out there now. And now, you know, with, now with, with AI assisted Dharma talks, I mean, I met someone recently. This is no joke, Jason. I tell this to you as a brother and a friend, because you're in the field too, just to get a reaction from someone, whatever it's worth, an older practitioner, maybe this guy was with this guy and he's all a beautiful person, beautiful, almost saintly existence. And practice, kind of doesn't do like Zen, but kind of some sort of augmented practice. Really, really nice, beautiful, kind of angel. But he has kind of like guided meditations for parts of his retreats, which is okay, whatever gets you into it. And, and Jason, he's, he has started using chat GPT to write teachings which he gives in spoken monologue while people have been brought into a meditative and hopefully non-dual state let's uh i mean let's look at this because i, I just did a video mm. and it was called can chat gpt answer koans <laughs> mm. So uh, it's an interesting video. It was mostly for entertainment, but someone asked me about it. So I typed it in there. And it's like, there's so, there, obviously, I don't think there's a replacement for in-person connection. Yeah. 
Well, for sure. Yeah, you don't get the magic of the Kongan. So let's talk about, yeah, maybe like how, how have you adapted the teachings, you know, recently with like, what, what do you stress at your Zen center there? You have sitting meditation, you do koan interviews. I st- we stress here, we stress here because it really is a collective effort. We stress here. I mean, I've kind of set out the direction and, you know, remind and whatever, but we stress here direct and authentic entrance into yeah, entrance bullshit word and, <laughs> um, direct direct encounter attainment whatever you want to say with in a very profound state the before thinking mind which they something we call don't know or someone called beginner or, or I don't even like beginner's mind but that's it or, 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 you know, true nature. So what we emphasize here is that, is that, that and that alone, that is it. And it is a, you know, there is a fierceness. I have, a, you know, I, I don't do that in any sort of like, that's a good thing. Like a conductor, I feel that my obligation is, and so I take my obligation kind of seriously, that means fierceness, with that, to make happen that when every person leaves, everything has been done to optimize the, 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 the seal, the dojang of a taste of their infinite right now true nature as it is and leave them with tools to learn, to do that themselves in their everyday life so that they're not dependent on me or the retreat to do it retreats of course are important but the experience we're just getting ready for a retreat right now so our team has been kind of disparate for the summer and so we're bringing bringing the instruments back into tuning everything about the retreat is for that experience and in the beginning of the retreat i'm kind of in their faces a little bit because people come in off the street off a bad relationship off of a situ- off of traffic off the airport off of this and through a certain kind of um engagement that's very deliberate and comes from the retreats i did over the years the first day i'm in there really like tr- not obvious but clearly there the second day i'm stepping back more and the third day I'm almost not even there, you know, in terms of being involved in moving their experience towards don't know. But I take very deliberate pains to really, truly make it as absolutely clear as possible. I hope you you can hear this as possible, that they will, that they do leave this experience that they've committed time and resources and effort to that i will say most people leave with an incredibly strong firm and solid that marks them forever the part of your question that i think you're pointing more towards is about change or something is the question of konans and teaching konan practice and this is a um, important and significant topic in its own right. Um, because I'm very, very aware that De Sansanim was, let's just say it, he, let's be frank, because he was about it. He was, and justly so, he was very proud of the Kongan um specificity and clarity and no bullshit and non-scholarly and very very living kongan tradition i mean that he inherited but it was all that he renewed that he revolutionized that he revolutionized from some bullshit thing with old dead poems as an answer into how to function in this complicated world. So this is really important, Jason, and I want to say this correctly, and and I'm choosing this opportunity to say it one time Mm -hmm. in this discussion, just so it's like 
out of the way because in some way it's kind of weird because I mean, it's, you could Google it in some way. It's a weird position to be in, not to teach his Kongans the way he did, but wait, bookmark that because it's weird. And I feel responsibility in some weird way, not responsibility for it, but I feel responsible for how this expression is perceived in some way because I helped, I was given the incredible honor and humble opportunity to work together on editing and publishing his book of Kongans. Mm. And that was something he was deeply proud of accomplishing because he had this record of showing this is everyday life and everything. And he gave talks on it. I mean, this was so, I mean, I'm not building that. That's the importance, his Kongan, not system. I never like it said that he had a Kongan system. Some part has systematic aspects, but it's not important. But it was, it was a, it was, it was a Kongan vitality, explosiveness, but, uh, I kind of feel I kind of feel he wouldn't be teaching it today if that doesn't sound too arrogant to say, but I think we can speak openly because, you know, I mean, so I, I, you know, I just want to get back. I feel this responsibility that I, that I highlight um, this truth about it because, you know, at the one point it, it would seem like I'm denying a very real and important thing that he made by not teaching it. And I feel almost like a son's, Really, this is a, a, a kind of not disloyalty or something that I, I should pass on the inheritance the way I received it and the way De Bong Sanim, you know, and De Kwang Sanim and De Guan Sanim and, um, and Bon Song and Sansa and, and, and Jane Sansa, Song Hyang Sansa, how they all like really passed down so clearly and unlike they, they have it you know unaltered and they, it's just so amazing that that gets passed down that it but i feel like i should be doing that in some way because i it revolutionized my life kung on practice to a point and then when i became a teacher i saw how distracting it can be for a student practitioner when i saw on the other side of the cushion. The whole retreat is them developing faithful contact with don't know. Not with me. The other thing is an interview, then there's the whole me, I'm a teacher thing. You know, I mean, it, it just has to be for the plane to fucking fly in that way. I mean, there is, I am, but I, doing it more in the non-dual space of silence and chanting and sitting and bowing and really not interacting with them at all, except for that, together with them? Yeah, you can actually, it happens, it happens. Then people have this, this happening happens. Anyway, it's happening, <laughs> but we, we strip away any kind of distraction and even the teaching can be a distraction. Yeah, if I'm, if I'm in the room with them and facing away, you know, I really do. I make effort that it's not like focused on Hyung Gak or teacher. I don't want to hold, but in the beginning I am the first day I just launch them off because something's got to bring everyone onto the same page. So there's a little stronger chanting sometimes, or I'm a little bit more reminding in the bowing, you know, breathing in breathing out but I, but over the course of the retreat my job is to get the hell away and they fly the thing themselves you remember that first feeling when you first time you i just had that today for some reason it was, oh some bike i went on a bike ride yesterday and i was remembering something and that first feeling you had as a kid when finally no one was letting was holding your hips on the bike right. and that first feeling you went like four yards before you ended up like crashing right. on your face. <laughs> that, but even that, I remember like I fell down and I was like happy, you know, cause I felt right. that freedom. That freedom. And I want people leaving. They must, it's not like I want, there's, there's this compulsion here sitting, talking to you that is compelled maniacally 
that people leave having had some deep impress of their own, not from me, not from Hyang Gaksanim, but that they have that feeling of because they're going to get back to the world and it's going to fucking smack them in the face. But I don't want them leaving a retreat like, oh, that Kong, oh, maybe then, oh, when's the next retreat? Oh, he only gives that. And then they're asking you for more interviews. And then people are going, can you do it on Tuesday nights too? Because I can't make it on the retreats. And no, no, you don't get that wasting of what time you have. God damn it. But De Sanzanim made it, and I've sent people to it. I send people to Musang San. Just, there's, it's not like this is bullshit. I'm saying this character set, unfortunately, is not wired to optimally use that as his own. And it shouldn't be something you use as a tool. Of, you got to make it because he made it his own. He made it 100% his own. De Bong Sunim has made it his own. Some teachers do. Some don't. That's just life. So we talked a lot about form, teaching styles, and I really appreciate you sharing your teaching and, and how you approach practice and teaching Zen. Leave us with this, because we talked a lot about stuff and form, mm. teachings, mm. but if you're just going to narrow down very shortly, what, what is the most important? What is the most important? Yeah, what is the most important? Sitting in front of this iPhone, having this Zoom communication with you, Jason Quinn, Judo Pope Sonim. Is that important? <laughs> Not enough. <laughs> Motherfucker. <laughs> I know you're good. You're a good buddy, Safa. I know, I know what you're doing there. That's cool. That's really great. You revealed the whole teaching for us. <laughs> you helped us reveal. We manifest together. We manifested together. Thank you very much, my Dharma brother. Thank you so much for doing this. And also, please put questions down below, put your comments down below. And obviously, we're going to have to do this again to cover uh, other things. But yeah. I'm oh, are people still watching? People, are people still well, watching knows? this? We'll see. <laughs> okay. Yeah. yeah. See. Just uh, All right. ask any kind of questions. It's great talking yeah. to you, Jason. Well, I mean, this, this is you. recorded. This is not live. So we're going to put this in a, in, a, in a video format. But I'm just saying, people who are watching this video, put your questions and comments down below. Sanim, mm -hmm. thank you so much for doing this. I really appreciate you.